Subcommittee will come to order. Well, good morning. And uh, I'm excited to kick off my second committee hearing of this Congress as the new chairman. Thanks to the bold vision of President Biden, we stand at the crossroads of a once in a generation opportunity to transform the nation's passenger rail network and bring it into the 21st century. The title of today's hearing says it all, unlimited potential of emerging technologies in high-speed rail. From hyperloop to bullet trains to magnetic levitation, we will hear about transformative technologies from distinguished panels of policy experts and leaders of high-speed rail projects. Imagine being able to hop on a train in Newark at 9 a.m. in the morning and make it to Washington in time for today's hearing at 11 a.m. High-speed rail could be the technology that fully unlocks the potential of passenger rail travel in this country. Other countries have integrated high-speed rail systems into their transportation networks, and the United States has the opportunity to do the same. We have led the world in innovation from breaking the sound barrier to winning the space race. There is nothing stopping us from applying the same perseverance to high-speed rail. But we also must confront the reality of limited resources. Even if we invest the tens of billions of dollars that is in the American Jobs Plan, it will not be enough to fully implement every project that we will hear about today. That is why we must have today's conversation that could be the basis for tomorrow's solutions. This is not to say Congress hasn't taken action to help spur high-speed rail uh, to deliver on the benefits that are possible. Congress has made significant investments that has made Amtrak's high-speed Accela train operational. Last year, Chairman DeFazio ushered HR2 through the House to invest $60 billion in the U.S. rail system. Given President Biden's call for even more rail funding, I'm proposing a robustly funded high-speed rail planning and development in our surface transportation reauthorization package. It is time for the United States makes a long-term bold effort to bring greater mobility to the nation. If we invest in easy access to an interconnected rail network, it will create thousands of jobs. Communities will benefit from the implementation of high-speed rail. However, we must ensure the benefits are equitably distributed and, under, and underserved communities are not left out in the cold. Equity in high-speed rail also means a fair shot for minority-owned businesses to obtain work that comes from the implementation of these projects. We have assembled a wide roster of witnesses for a robust discussion of high-speed rail. I want to hear why it is good policy to invest in high-speed rail I wanted to hear how these technologies could redefine short and long distance travel. <clears throat> and I finally want to hear about how these technologies can be made available to all Americans. It is my hope members gain a better understanding of the promise that high speed rail represents and how it can be a positive force for change. So I hope you will join me in this subcommittee's effort to appreciate the rail technologies of the future. And now we will recognize the chairman of the whole committee, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, the opportunity today. I, I'm excited about the prospects uh, for this hearing. Uh, basically, uh, we're looking at, I would say, four categories of rail. Uh, one is what I call higher speed rail, uh, high speed rail, uh, magnetic uh, levitation, and then uh, obviously new and innovative technologies uh, like Hyperloop. Uh, they all hold promise in different applications in different places. Um, higher speed rail, uh, which would be basically uh, existing Amtrak, uh, I'll use the example of the uh, Talgo train sets we run here uh, between uh, Oregon and uh, Washington State, uh, they can go 120 miles an hour. 
I'm 112 miles from Portland. Uh, theoretically, then I could be there in less than an hour. Uh, if, uh, if you could get to Portland in less than an hour, uh, I think you would see a massive hemorrhaging of people away from uh, the overcrowded Interstate 5, which frequently is blocked with accidents or traffic jams, uh, onto a, a dependable service. Now, we, we wouldn't, don't even have to realize the full potential of it. Uh, if we could, if I could reliably get there in two hours, because uh, on a really good day I can get there in an hour fifty on I five, uh, then I would never ever get on I five again. And I know there are many thousands of other Oregonians in this line. Ultimately, this was one of the first designated under the Swift uh, Act back in 1994. Al Swift, a colleague from Washington State, a wonderful old curmudgeon. Uh, uh, created this program uh, and one of the first high-speed rail routes in America and there's a couple of witnesses who are a little short on their testimony because they say Portland to Vancouver uh, or Portland to Seattle. Uh, that route which I got designated in 94 is Eugene, Oregon, the second largest city uh, to Vancouver, BC. Precious little progress has been made uh, particularly by my state who I don't think has even yet chosen a route. But there's tremendous potential in higher speed rail, uh, let alone high speed rail. Uh, you know, many years ago, uh, when I was a younger uh, man uh, and traveled a bit with less constraint than this job, uh, I was in Spain and they had uh, trains essentially like ours, uh, crappy old slow trains. Uh, and, uh, you know, then they built one route. Uh, and it, it ran from uh, Madrid down to the coast. And after a while, everybody in Spain rode on it once or twice. And they said, yeah, I want that. They now have a high-speed network, goes around the whole country. Uh, it has changed economics, demographics, uh, the economy, phenomenal. Uh, people can live uh, you know, in an affordable place more than 100 miles uh, outside of Madrid and reliably get to work in a very short uh, period of time. Uh, we have similar opportunities, and we'll hear about one later today in the Los Angeles Basin, uh, linking a line out of LA to a line, uh, a high-speed line coming down from Las Vegas, uh, which has tremendous potential. Uh, you know, there are other projects uh, around the country that, that we'll hear from today. So, um, you know, rail could be a solution. Uh, VDOT of uh, Virginia Department of Transportation gave testimony, uh, I guess, six or seven weeks ago before the committee, uh, the secretary, very compelling. Uh, they evaluated 95 cells uh, and they said, wow, you know, the, the traffic is just always backed up. Uh, we could add one lane each way, 10 to $12 billion. By the time we finish adding the lanes, uh, congestion will be as bad as it is today. That'd be about 10 years from now. Or uh, we could look at uh, somehow enhancing, it'll be difficult, uh, rail commuting. And they got into uh, discussions with uh, CSX and uh, they came to an agreement that's going to both enhance the CSX network and uh, help with the commuter trains. And they're actually going to build a new bridge over the Potomac River. Now, the total, it's very expensive. This whole thing's going to cost four or five billion dollars. Well, that's half the cost of adding the two lanes to the freeway that won't solve the problem, and this will uh, provide much more benefit, benefit for commuters, uh, benefit uh, for the economy, benefit for the environment uh, when we eliminate all those single occupancy automobiles. So we've got to look around the country, uh, and part of the bill is to make DOTs, because a lot of DOTs are stuck in the, you know, the Eisenhower era. And it's like, whoa, well, we'll, just, we'll just lay more concrete, we'll lay more asphalt, we'll widen to eight lanes here, we'll go to 10 lanes. Uh, and you build it and they come. And then you're back where you started. Uh, I've met uh, with communities in uh, Texas who believe that there's linkages between cities there that could solve some of their worst uh, freeway problems uh, and highway problems in Texas. And I, I've, I've heard this echoed around the country. I mean, Florida, they're looking at linking Miami to Orlando in, in the not too distant future with Brightline. So there's, you know, there's a lot of exciting things going on, but where's the federal government? Where has the federal government been? I mean, the Chinese are investing over a hundred billion dollars a year. Of course, a lot of it's our money with our trade deficit, uh, so they can afford it uh, in their rail system for high-speed rail. 
uh, what are we investing? Uh, virtually nothing. Uh, and uh, when you invest nothing, you get nothing. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can't say, oh, yeah, well, back in the Obama era, they put up all this money for high speed rail and, you know, California screwed it up. Well, yeah, the Greenfield project, uh, they did not anticipate all the problems would come with that. Uh, and they were very poorly managed to begin with. They've gotten their act together now, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of a lot lost there. But that should not be uh, the example for the country, or we should say just because of one uh, project that didn't proceed as projected uh, that we are going to abandon these hopes all around uh, the United States and investing once every other decade a small amount of money is not going to get us there. Uh, I'd like to see larger sums than have been proposed by the Biden administration in the high speed rail category personally, uh, but we also need to enhance the, uh, the loan programs, the TIFIA program and others, uh, our RIF program. Uh, and so that we can look at investments uh, in, in these areas. You know, we, we have put uh, aggregate um, with essentially post-World War II, uh, mostly the Eisenhower program, uh, $2 trillion trillion into highways invested by the federal government, a lot of money. Put uh, post-World uh, War II, $777 billion into aviation, uh, airports, runways, uh, air traffic control, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and we have put uh, about uh, 90 uh, billion total into rail. And so we wonder why we have a decrepit, pathetic network uh, in this country. Uh, Amtrak struggling, uh, you know, with the uh, with infrastructure that's failing, uh, you know, I took the committee up to New York between uh, between uh, Washington D.C. and Boston. I think there's 48 billion dollars of deferred maintenance, uh, some of which could fail catastrophically. Uh, the tunnel under Baltimore uh, is one example, uh, and replacing that tunnel, and they have plans to do it with straight in line would uh, would uh, increase speeds uh, through that section, uh, cut a significant amount of time off the route. But hey, you know, um, we put a lot of money into that tunnel back in 1872. We can't just jump out there and build a new one, can we? Really? Uh, great engineers in 1872. Uh, but uh, it's time to get into the 21st century. So that's what this hearing is about today. Let's talk about 21st century technology, 21st century solutions, uh, not 1950s, not 1870s. Uh, the 21st century, and let's make America once again a world leader in all forms of transportation as we used to be. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will be hearing testimony from witnesses on two panels today, with each panel followed by questions from members. I would like now to welcome the witnesses on the first panel. Uh, the Honorable John Picari, former Deputy Secretary, United States Department of Transportation. Ms. Rachel Smith, President and Chief Executive Officer of Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Philip Washington, Executive Officer of Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Ms. Daniel Eckert, International Representative uh, representative of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and the Honorable Troy Carbett Trey Duhon III, Judge Waller County, Texas, and um, Andy Coons, President and Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Uh, since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the Senate Committee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Mr. Picari, you may proceed. Uh, Chairman Payne, Ranking Member Crawford, members of the subcommittee, Chairman DeFazio, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to testify today on this important topic. My name is John Picari. I've had the opportunity to serve in a number of transportation and economic development related positions in the public and private sectors, including the honor of serving as Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation 
and twice serving as Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. It's my strong belief that high-speed rail systems, higher-speed city pairs, and emerging technologies all play an important part in a more equitable, climate-friendly transportation system that builds tomorrow's economy. If you wonder why America's transportation system is configured the way it is today, I would urge you to follow the money. Allow me to illustrate the point from personal experience. The Maryland Department of Transportation is uniquely organized as a multimodal state transportation organization, including highway, transit, aviation, passenger rail, and other components under one roof and served by a unified, flexible state transportation trust fund. That single trust fund provides funds for every transportation mode using revenues from every transportation source. As I evaluated ways to increase capacity in the Baltimore, New York City corridor, these were my choices. I could add air capacity between BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport in New York with 90% federal funding for runway and taxiway improvements. I could add highway capacity in I-95 to New York with 80% federal funding or add passenger rail capacity with zero federal funding. For that 215 mile segment, a passenger rail trip makes far more sense than driving or flying, yet passenger rail capacity was the least likely alternative to be selected. So if you wonder why we have the unbalanced transportation system we have today, follow the money. Seen in that light, it's an extraordinary state, a statement of state priorities that the California High Speed Rail Authority's 2020 business plan anticipates 85% of its funding from state sources and only 15% federal funding for this project of national and regional significance. This is a remarkable state financial commitment and a clear declaration of the state's project priorities. Yet there's no ongoing sustained federal financial partner for this multi-year program of projects. To match the people carrying capacity of phase one of the high-speed rail system, California would need to invest 122 to $199 billion towards building almost 4,200 highway lane miles, the equivalent of a new six lane highway and the construction of 91 new airport gates and two new runways. The San Francisco Los Angeles air route is already the ninth busiest in the world and the busiest air route in America. Doesn't it make sense to prioritize this finite and expensive airport capacity for tr transcontinental and international flights? For California, the 122 to 199 billion of required highway and airport capacity as an alternative to high-speed rail is double the 69 to 99 billion cost estimate of phase one of the high-speed rail system. The genius of federalism as it applies to our transportation system is that states and local jurisdictions make the project choices that are best for their particular needs. These local project choices aggregate into a national transportation system. While states and local jurisdictions across the country have raised significant new revenues over the last decade, they still require a federal funding partner for any significant capital project. Providing real transportation choices at the local and state level requires the establishment of a passenger rail trust fund on par with our highway trust fund and airport and airway trust fund. A rail trust fund will solidify and encourage local decision-making and project choices for those jurisdictions that choose to prioritize passenger rail. Decades of multi-year federal funding gave America the world's best aviation system. Likewise, our interstate highway system grew from initially disconnected city pairs into today's national network only with the guaranteed financial contribution of the federal government. A passenger rail trust fund will do the same for community growth and development in towns and cities across the country while building U.S. manufacturing and technological leadership. There are public and private sector passenger rail projects currently being proposed in every region of the country. A consistent, predictable federal funding partner will jumpstart those projects, encouraging new technologies, mutually beneficial collaboration with our freight railroads, and innovations in investment, construction, and operations models. A high-speed rail network built on local choices requires a level financial playing field. Establishing a passenger rail trust fund is the way to do it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'll be happy to answer any questions.